Hey there, everybody. Sorry, I have been, um, away. I've been doing shit. I'm actually, uh, working on a commission at the moment. Oh, my God. This thumbprint, shh. No. With its behaviors and such. I'll show you what I'm actually going to be painting while we're watching these videos. I would have, like, been posting shit, but I just couldn't be fucked, honestly. I'm just being... I, ju I just didn't care. I really didn't care. Not that I don't care. But it's like... It's weird to explain, but it's just one of those things where it's just like, yeah, I don't want anyone getting stuck on me. Not like Lou, not like that Sugarland song, because it was just like, did you ever see the video for that? It was creepy as fuck. Let me show you what I'm going to be, um, sketching up really quick. I'm working on this. Right here. I gotta figure out how to, um, get this nice glowy look, which I don't think is going to be hard, now that I know a little better about what I'm doing. For the most part... You know, I, that's an easy, like, just orange with a blue top. I'm not good with clouds, though. But but these are pretty, like, neat clouds, so it doesn't matter. But that's, I think, going to be pretty easy to, like, actually, like, do. I'm kind of worried, though, because, like, this is actually, like, I, I like, is, are those people back there? Enhance. Enhance. And hats. She's got pretty hair. I really like that jacket. Wow, I can really zoom in on this son bitch. How far can I go? Hold on. That's it? That looks like some people's heads, but those might be things. But actually, that's kind of cool, because that helps me see a little better. I didn't know it would go that far in. Huh. Yeah. That's going to be fun. That's going to be a lot of yellow with some orange tag with a little bit of dark purples possibly with the orange blended in and probably do the same with the clouds. I'm excited. Like this will be like my first really really um I'll say expensive commission. Like I'm actually making big bucks at this point. I'm actually super duper excited for that. Um Totally was not expecting it. Give me a second, because it's just like, I gotta... That shit, that was not what I was trying to do, but okay. I think I'm in the right thing. I think. But yeah, that's what I'm going to be working on while we watch this. We're going to be watching... Oh, God. There we go. There, there you go. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. How does life come up with its own programming language. Because if you remember, um, we watched footage of the uh, fractal DNA and realized that it does come up with a crazy pattern and makes it look like an endless broccoli on one side. Or many sides. Just somehow, right? But <coughs> random as fuck. Doesn't make any sense, does it? We're going to be watching that and we're also going to watch Two Trillion Planets Have Gone Missing and We Don't Know Why. And I think that one will be interesting just for funsies. I want to look at these two, but those are an hour long in peace and I don't want to be here for that long. I have some coffee. I want to focus on uh, getting this shit done. And I at least need to do something on here because I keep free. Like, it's like I keep missing days and I'm not meaning to, but it's just like I've just been involved with life. Also, I want to see how this comes out on a um, pulp paper versus my cotton paper because I want to paint this. Uh, like, I, I'm a total believer in, like, at least doing two studies with painting. Like, I've always done it with acrylics. Not so much oils, but I didn't fuck with oils too much because I didn't like it. And acetone just... Turpentine. I mean, let, like, uh, let me tell you about turpentine. Turpentine never comes the fuck out. Turpentine will never come out. No matter what you do, no matter what the soap, it is stronger than the soap. Turpentine is what you use if you really are mad at that painting and you don't care about the consequences anymore. You're just like, I just want to finish this. I want to get done. And that's one of the reasons I didn't fuck with uh, oils for too long because I love my patience. Acrylics... Acrylics were easy. Acrylics were, like, absolutely easy. Especially when I learned how to water them down a little bit. 
They almost look like watercolors, but there's no way to reuse them once they're dried up. Watercolors is what acrylics wish it could be. Because I can use watercolors over and over again, no matter how much they dry. Maybe not with the same th thickness it had before all the water came out. But I can still use it, even as a shadow. But the paint sits on top of pulp or wood paper. Meanwhile, cotton paper absorbs that. Like a Huggies for babies. So, anyway, let's start this. Like, already two seconds in because it started on me. Hey, right, babe. This is fun. Yeah. This is the Krebs cycle. It's a loop programmed into the cell to extract energy from all sorts of nutrient sources. Hold on. Why are you so fucking quiet, bro? It's only six thirty in the evening. Shit. the Krebs cycle. It's a loop programmed into the cell to extract energy from all sorts of nutrient sources. But where does it come from? How did nature come up with this design? How does life come up with its programming language? Right, that's a, always a good question. Like, how did you do it? Let's break this question down one step at a time. To be more specific, what I meant by programming language is the processes that the cells use to transform one substance into another. These are what we call pathways in biology. And, like factories, there are small machines along the way that gradually modify your starting material into your end product. These little machines are known as enzymes. So, a pathway is essentially a series of chemical reactions that allow cells to transform one substance, also known as metabolites, into another with the aid of enzymes. I trust that those of you in the audience that know even a little bit of biology have a very similar intuition. I mean, this map is probably what you have in mind when I say pathways, right? In this video, not only am I going to tell you where these come from, but I'm also going to show you why this picture oh, right that's here a lot of math. is actually that's way too much. I just looked and at that. And by the end of this video, I'll show you how we can tame this evolutionary power for our own use. See, this guy's kind of intimidating because he's got the two most simplest shit right here. But then he puts the whole formula here, and I'm like, wait. I look down for two seconds, and all of a sudden we're in a whole different country, speaking three languages all at the same time with this overtone and vocal shit. I can't do that. I've never tried that, and... Yeah. God damn, that's... I don't know why we're not in theater mode. There we go, y'all. That's a little better. I still can't see shit. And I'm far excited. That Carbon fusion. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Let's get started. To pay homage to the physics-oriented folks in the audience, we're going to be diving into this problem using one of the best ways we know how. First principles. Now, imagine you're a cell trying to survive in a world full of cells, okay. and you happen to be surrounded by a bunch of your other friends. It's a cell eat cell world, world there motherfucker. There are some super special power-up gems floating around, and these gems make you the god amongst your friends. So if you manage to snag one, you gain a ton of power. And only a few of you have acquired such special gems. Oh, only a few select have gotten a certain special something, right? Like a blood type or a bloodline or maybe just a, 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 the crazies. It doesn't really matter. It comes down somewhere, but someone got it. Someone got something special about them. Do they, though? Mm -hmm. Oh, I break. It shouldn't be. You've been screaming your head off at me all day today, and yet... Yeah, okay, whatever. That makes no sense. But yeah, special shit. Special things. Speed. 
That makes you guys very adept at surviving in this open world game. But, as time passes, you run out of your awesome power-up gems. Boohoo. But, let's say you happen to have the power, the machinery, to create new power-up gems from the more common gems that yes. are found lying everywhere in your inventory. That would put you back on the pedestal, right? Maybe. This does come with a catch though. You can run out of these dull gems, and as a result, lose your power. So one of you that has a small gem creation method will thrive at this stage. We can keep going and going and going, and voila, we have a pathway. This is what we call the retrograde hypothesis, and Horowitz was the one who came up with it. Isn't it amazing how just from simple first principles thought experiments, you can see how pathways naturally emerge out of this? Except, it's incomplete. Why? Because this hypothesis doesn't explain everything. Let's look at a counter evidence. Back in 1965, Sam Granick was studying how heme and chlorophyll are both synthesized. Heme being the oxygen carrier in your blood and chlorophyll being the light absorber for photosynthesis. If we take the retrograde hypothesis to be true, then heme must have been imported and the chemicals leading up to heme should not have any ability or significance or advantage, right? They're akin to the dull gems from earlier. Well, that's not what we see here. The molecule before this step can also do what heme and chlorophyll can do, albeit at a slower rate. So, he proposed a new hypothesis. The end product end serves product? a useful function, but a step can be added to further improve the end product again, meaning that the intermediates along the way were once, perhaps themselves, functional end products of a pathway. This is almost the complete opposite of what we had earlier, the most important yeah, seems like cheating. of this hypothesis, however, doesn't hinge on this, but in the fact that the chemicals themselves, the metabolites, evolve along with the enzymes. So, did pathways build themselves backwards like the first hypothesis, or did they optimize forwards step by step like the second? They sound equally intuitive, don't they? But the reason that they sound so intuitive is precisely why they're both incomplete, and our skewed intuition comes from one source. Bullshit. Most of us learning biology have an incomplete oh. conception of what proteins and enzymes can actually do. We often think of enzymes as being machines that sit inside of the cell, waiting to do their specific job. We like to imagine them more or less as fixed structures, but this is an incomplete intuition, because a lot of enzymes are, in fact, more like soft moldable clay than hard rigid rocks. A lot of enzymes can have more than one function, and these are known as promiscuous enzymes. The little chemical robot arms inside the enzyme may look very specific for that one enzyme's job, but in reality, it's only Nigga, that looks like a whole alien. for look a at job. It. In the right. Look at it. That's a whole abomination. The way it's moving and shit. It's a whole. T oh, it's the '90s telephone cord coming back to haunt us, like ah, us all in our sleep. That's what that is. Death. That's what that. Is. It's death. death. Is this still going? Or did I fuck it up? No, it's still going. I didn't fuck it up. Good deal. Environment. These robot arms can be made to do this one reaction type for multiple chemicals that are kind of similar. If you change the structural arrangement around the same robot arm, i.e. the active site, you can alter the reaction being performed. You can totally see this in action in this animation here. Of course, there are limits to this. It's all good if the reactions are related. Right. Oh, shit, my bad enough, but there are multiple types of chemical reactions and they require vastly different active sites, so please keep that in mind. In short, this flexible nature of enzymes allows for it to be very versatile, yet optimizable to a certain extent. And you'll see why this is incredibly useful 
from building pathways in the next two hypotheses. Having the promiscuous nature of enzymes in mind, one can rationalize the patterns from reaction modules such as something called the C1 module. What is the C1 module? It's a big family of reactions that involve elongating molecules by one carbon. The reactions themselves share the same chemistry. Therefore, like different species in evolution, they could have come from the same common ancestor. The ancestor here is assumed to be a generalist that has the active site for this reaction, but it's not geared towards anything just yet. Right. Over time, though, they can be duplicated and evolve in separate trajectories for different tasks. But yet again, this model doesn't explain everything. The evolutionary trajectory can be complicated and full of function gains and losses over time. And Are you noticing how there is a consistency with the only thing consistent is that it's always incomplete? You know, almost like we're not allowed to know what the answer is. It's very consistent. Very consistent. The evidence is also hard to come by. In addition, the enzymes can also converge onto the same function, just like how dolphins and sharks look very similar but have completely different ancestries. One other take you can go with, knowing enzyme promiscuity, is that you can make a hypothesis about how new pathways are built. The existence of promiscuous enzymes implies that there is an underground, hidden, network of reactions that make, for now, useless chemicals. However, if we force an evolutionary pressure that requires that very useless chemical, the cells that will survive are going to be the ones that have that chemical. You know what else uh, like is made when you apply pressure? Diamonds. And diamonds were nothing but useless rocks. They just happen to be hard as fuck. I'm gonna get some more coffee. I'll be right back. Alrighty, I'm back. So, yeah, anyway. um, What the fuck was I just saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, honey all over my hands. You can also apply pressure to coal in some instances since they're made of the same... Um, Makeup of whatever, whatever you want to say. Mm, not enzymes, not atoms, not DNA. It's something that they're com they're made of the same composition of stuff. I don't know what stuff. It's kind of like uh, crystals and viruses are made of the same shit. They're literally the same thing, just form different. That's all. Um. But it's just like, pressure causes things to change. This could easily be a virus, but it's a crystal instead. I'm literally not making that up. I learned that in the science book, and I don't know why I fucking remember that. But it was one of the coolest things I ever learned. Like, I also learned from an ICP song that you can make, like, gunpowder out of limestones, but it will not buy you a cheeseburger. And I thought that was, like... The best useless information ever, because it's actually absolutely useless. Knowing that I can't buy a cheeseburger with the knowledge that was just bestowed to me is useless enough, but now I have it, and I know I can't get a cheeseburger, so it's just like, why did you even tell me this? Why did you even waste my time? Anyway, back to this. Even though the enzymes used are very general in the first place, over time, though, these generalists can become gradually optimized, Thus, a new pathway is born. This is known as the patchwork hypothesis, and it is the most accepted hypothesis in the community at this point. Ain't Although some, that's it does bullshit. come with its own chicken and egg problem. If the new path this does not look like some Final Fantasy like crystal evolution growth, like Final Fantasy VII remake, right? They got this whole crystal thing going on, and it's similar to what happened in Final Fantasy XIII, except. The crystal thing in 7 makes way more sense. The crystal shit in 13 was objectionally just as trashy as the game the first 35 hours before you get to the underworld place. I can't remember what the fuck it's called. Like, I got there, I was so fucking confused. This game trained me to go in a straight line the entire time, and then I got here and I was like, what? Where the fuck am I? Why is everything way stronger than me? What the fuck? That was one thing that got to me. It's just like, this is, okay, so I got, like, all these folk. They are fighting all at once. I only get three of them in a row, which is stupid. It, traveling, it, it, like, it was a stupid shit. Like, if I'm traveling in a group and I only got three out of the six or seven folk I have, 
Why is it I can only control one of them? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm this nerdy now. But in the old traditional games, you can control all the characters in RPGs, right? Because they're your party. For some reason now in RPGs, they do like the quick time shit. Final Fantasy VII fixed this to where like you could switch to that party member control them. And I think thirteen had something like it in it too. But for the most part, whoever was the party leader, that's the only person you could play. Everyone else had their roles. I don't even know if you could really switch until like so far into the game. Seven, yeah, you could do that. It shows you that automatically. Thirteen, fuck that game. Fuck that game. I, I like, it, it takes a lot for me not to finish a video game. Even in my age, I will still play a game until I finish it. I just want to go through everything. I'm slow with it, but I'm going to beat that game. Um, but not 13. Anyway, I'm done with rambling about me being a nerd. Let's continue with the lesson. My bad, y'all. It, it was just one of those things. I just had to get it out. Like, I, I just need to cry it out. That's all. Cry with me. Cry with me. All right, I'm, uh, let's go back to other nerd shit. Pathway comes from parts of old pathways. Where do the old pathways come from? So before I unveil the fully complete model, I think it's very good to recap the previous hypotheses to fully grasp how they connect. Okay. Horowitz said that pathways are built backwards since the end product is what is required. End products deplete intermediate, so more enzymes are needed upstream for production. Yet it describes only a few pathways. Granick said that the pathways are actually built forwards. The end products can serve the function, but recruiting additional steps can optimize the product even further. Right. In essence, enzymes and their metabolites evolve together. Yet both of these don't address the true nature of enzymes. Cass and Jensen said that enzymes that share the same reaction type originate from a generalist, promiscuous ancestor. This ancestor can duplicate and diverge into their niche pathways. I'm sorry, what kind of yeah, ancestor? Yeah, it doesn't really. Booting additional steps can optimize the product even further. In essence, enzymes and their metabolites evolve together. Yet both of these don't address the true nature of enzymes. Cass and Jensen said that enzymes that share the same reaction type originate from a generalist, promiscuous ancestor. This ancestor... Does this to say was a hoe ancestor? What? Promiscuous? Yes! Look, no, 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 Come here. So we all can read this together. Promiscuous generalist promiscuous. I don't know what generalist is. I'm taking this in the most layman way ever. You're telling me that the hoes are the reason why, like, 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 are you, like there are hoe enzymes. It's in the DNA, y'all. It, it's inescapable. Go on and slut it up. That's how the ancestors wanted it. Mind you, I haven't watched either of the videos I'm recording tonight, so it's just... I know I'm say I'm I'm looking at this in a really ignorant way, but it, but I just thought immediately heard "Sexy Reds Pound Town." I've never listened to that song. I listen to everybody else talk about that song. That's the only reason I know that song exists. So, it just that popped up when I heard from it. It was just like, what the fuck? Like, we, we can't get away from it. They're all whores. They're all whores, y'all. Yeah. ...that can duplicate and diverge into their niche pathways. Yet, it doesn't really address convergent evolution. Lascano and Miller said that promiscuous enzymes make hidden connections between pre-existing pathways. These connections make chemicals, and if that chemical is selected for, the proteins get optimized and eventually become their own standalone pathway. Yeah, it does. What else, y'all? Do do y'all remember that there was something else that might have pre-existing pathways that connect and eventually become their own? Oh yeah, it's protons traveling at the speed of light in time traveling. Hmm. Maybe this has something to do with how light operates as well. Maybe there's a particular enzyme that resonates with light. It would explain, like, the people of the sun, huh? It doesn't address how old pathways came to be. These models all sound contradictory, but the last hypothesis I'm about to present actually says, in fact, that all of them are complementary. 
Isn't learning by deduction cool? It's like a fun puzzle you can play along as opposed to being fed information constantly. And luckily, today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, shares this philosophy of teaching with me. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. Brilliant is fun and interactive, with thousands of lessons from basic... Yeah, no, not trying to, like, knock you, dude, I swear. That's the most played part at the ending. Hold on, I need to find my, uh... Need an eraser. Alright, I'm back. For anyone who is into making your own art or whatever, on paper or whatever medium, even fucking wood, this is my favorite Castile, or however it's pronounced, kneading eraser. These are a godsend. Right? These you need, work it. What I normally do is I roll it into something like this. And you take it on your paper and you roll it over your paper. And it picks up the excess graphite. I don't know if you can see that. Which you probably can't because this is a screen, not in real life. But it's better than trying to take a white vinyl eraser or any sort of eraser to pick up anything you draw. Especially on watercolor paper because like, if you use an eraser on that, oh no. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't work like regular paper. Um, you want to pick up the graphite. You don't want to like end up like rubbing it in because it will rub in. It, it's an absorbent paper. It's not flat. Well, I don't know because I only mess with cold press. I've never fucked with hot press, and hot press is better for like finer details and shit. But I've never. But finer hot press paper is so fucking expensive. Like cotton paper is expensive in itself. Hot press paper is like three times way more expensive and a lot harder to use. But anyway, we need to get back to the lesson. Final hypothesis. So after God damn it. All is said and done, here's the final hypothesis. The essence of how pathways evolve doesn't depend on the metabolite nor the enzyme, but both of them evolving in concert. The hypotheses discussed earlier may be framed as conflicting, but they don't have to be. Especially when there are just four different modes for evolution, four different ways to do the same thing. Not one of them has to be the only one that's true. How does this happen? As in Hypothesis 4, new compounds appear initially as pointless products, where a selective advantage appears for that compound, it makes sense for the enzymes to be recruited. Right. But after all is said and done, those very same enzymes in the pathway can also be promiscuous, which will give rise to even more metabolites in the hidden. So it'll be hoes too. In Everyone addition, just learns. Oh, since mom was a hoe, I could be a hoe. These reactions together. You can when also will it end? Them using non-enzymatic reactions. These reactions occur on their own without real need for an enzyme. For example, the CO2 leaving reaction helps connect the two totally separate pathways together leading to a new way to make the final product. This leads to an overall incremental expansion of the metabolic network, metabolite and enzyme both, driven by promiscuous enzymes and non-enzymatic reactions. Let's look deeper at an individual recruitment event. Our final hypothesis also introduces one more, more general way of recruiting enzymes other than forwards or backwards. That is, if a step is limiting the rate of production, there is an incentive to include the enzyme there. If step 2 is slow, then we should include the enzyme there. If there's a pullback, then pull forwards harder. If it's all equal, increase the amount of stuff coming into the pathway. This doesn't conflict with either H1 nor H2, since you can easily have a situation where the initial and the final step can be, well, a slow step. Even though Perhaps Hypothesis 3 and 4 assumes that everything all happens at once, this still demands that each individual gene must be modified, one mutation at a time. Okay. But regardless of how they are recruited, like I said, one enzyme can be forced to diverge due to being borrowed or for usage in another emerging pathway. This creates a middle state where the enzyme is a generalist, much like the ancestral enzymes from Hypothesis 3. And when they diverge, they're part of the same reaction module, just like the C1 module. So, to recap a little bit, the enzymes evolve along metabolites yes. by means of enzyme promiscuity. 
the metabolic network can also be connected further by spontaneous non-enzymatic reactions. Recruiting each individual enzyme is a step-by-step -step process that happens due to a need to optimize how fast the whole pathway is going, or by going forwards or backwards. And finally, during the creation of a new pathway, the shared enzyme can diverge, thus becoming the ancestral enzyme that you see later on. This reminds me a lot of like System Shock, System Shock 2's hacking system and Bioshock's hacking system because it's literally almost the exact same thing. Because with the hacking system you had to figure out how to get the pipes to connect to flow from one thing to another but they all be like weird shapes and in some of the games you can only open certain ones or so many and then you have to switch them around and shit in order to make the pathways connect from one to another. That's what it kind of reminds me of a little bit. I might have alluded to that this hypothesis is the final and all be all. However, there are questions that can still be asked of it. For example... Hold on, y'all. Okay, sorry about that. I, like, I was talking to my dad about the cat. Even though it works really well for new Clayton. pathways, it doesn't completely explain how the core pathways, such as the Krebs cycle, pentose phosphate, or glycolysis, come from. Though the hypothesis doesn't fully explain these core pathways, certain parts of their evolution can be explained based on this model. For example, the T in DNA, thymidine, is just one group away from U in RNA. We can hypothesize that T could have evolved from U by means of a promiscuous enzyme's unintended side reaction, and that enzyme later became such a core part of metabolism that DNA uses T instead of U. Furthermore, our understanding of pathways and enzyme evolution isn't purely limited to understanding the past, we can also use it to invent our future. The animation you saw earlier in the video is actually an artificially evolved enzyme in a lab. Yeah, I was about to Ten say, it's kind of like a freak. And you can evolve this enzyme from one function into doing a very different reaction by changing how flexible some of the branches are. This not only gives valuable insight into how we can design enzymes, but it also proves that we can use evolution as a tool to design things similar to how we can train neural networks. And this brings me to the final point of the video. I mean, a better way to, like, assess that would be, like, how we, like, we can control evolution the same way that, like, we breed dogs. It, it, that's on a, a, a whole bigger scale, but the same principle. Like, you know how they bred certain dogs to have, like, traits like bloodhounds are good at sniffing shit? Um, Dobermans are scary and, and like, skinny. Um, German Shepherds are always, are always snitches for cops unless you own one, and then that motherfucker, he, 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 like, he's yours. But if someone speaks German, like, he's probably gonna listen to that, because honestly, German Shepherds are literally, like, dogs, like, adhere more to, like, a guttural uh, language, and German is literally, like, the best one for that. So it's just kind of like... Whoever speaks German wins the dog, I guess. But yeah, um, how we breed dogs is an excellent way of demonstrating um, how we can control evolution almost like an enzyme way. But this also feels like something you would do if you wanted the chimera or do gene splicing too. You know what I mean? Isn't it, isn't it weird that that sounds like that too? Huh. They clone Tyrone, did they? Or did they just fuck with his enzymes and shit? That's the real question. <laughs> I have no mouth that I must scream. Hmm? You might have noticed that these evolutionary hypotheses question one another and create questions in and of themselves, giving a more refined idea of reality as we keep doing so. Just like how you can evolve enzymes and pathways using evolutionary pressures, you can evolve scientific ideas further by asking questions and building off of ideas that came before you. To stand atop the shoulder of giants and reach for the skies. Thank you immensely for Yeah, watching. but the last time we did that, we stopped learning how to talk Thank to Thank you to other. some of the folks from the Tokuriki lab from MSL UBC for helping out with the making of this Ooh, video. Of it has been a great pleasure. Konoki. We liked the videos. It was a good video. Appreciate that. Alright, let's go to the next one.
Hopefully I haven't been spotted yet. Two trillion planets and have gone missing and we don't know why. This one I'm excited. This deals with the more recent shit we've been looking at. Hey, 42 here. As you know, the universe follows a predictable format. It contains galaxies, galaxies contain solar like systems, no, I, I, and solar systems contain- I don't know if I recall any of that, like, what the fuck he just said. I don't trust anything in the outside this fucking planet. At least with this planet, I can learn mostly how it operates, either through books or I guess people with TikToks on the internet, because apparently nobody trusts people who actually went to school for shit no more. It's no longer believable. You can learn that shit from any fucking idiot online. Uh, but I don't know if I want to know what's outside of here, because I'm not sure how even outside of here even works. How would they know what time it was if they were in... You know what? I'm thinking way too hard before I even start this, but go ahead. In all of the planets. This general galactic structure is one of the first things we learn about space as kids. And it's completely wrong. Because it turns out that planets aren't just found inside solar systems. Oh, they're not? Some, known as rogue planets, don't orbit stars at all. They just drift around out there alone in the vast emptiness of space. Oh, that sucks. And they what we're friend, about to we? uncover about them oh, no, not no, only no, rewrites our cosmic rule book, but, as you'll find out by the end of this video, completely changes the search for extraterrestrial life and what it means to be human. Huh? All those rogue planets drifting alone out there in the solitude of space with their unpredictable paths, they not knowing where to. their they future will lead, the reminds me of my struggles during the festive season when it comes mm -hmm. to managing stress and keeping on top of my busy workload. It's a very paradoxical time of year. We should all be coming together. But like rogue planets, some of us end up feeling more alone than ever before. But stress and the low moods How that come with it aren't just a seasonal issue. Ten days ago. And the earlier yeah. you can recognize it in your own thought patterns, the sooner you can enact positive change. So BetterHelp joined me in a paid partnership for this video. BetterHelp is an easy to use platform with a vast network of over 30,000 therapists. Some interesting f Look. If you're gonna go to therapy, don't you dare take what you learned in therapy and bring it out into the real world and act like you're teaching people about therapy. Because, like, nine times out of ten, unless you actually, like, went to college for therapy, you have no idea why your therapist is telling you the things that they're telling you. Why they're giving you the advice that they're giving you. Mm. I, like, there, like, like there, there's actually, like, specific things. Like, I didn't stay in it, in all the classes. I should have went to more, so I'd understood it better. Not that I would have gotten certified or anything, but there's a whole lot of shit. There's a whole lot of shit. There's a whole lot of background. There's a whole lot of manipulation you don't know that you can do to people until you actually start studying psychology itself. Like, it's amazing because people don't realize, like, yeah, psychology is not even 100 years old yet. But what we discovered about the human mind and how to fuck with it. Like, like, fuck psychology. Get a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook and, like, go to the section about, like, fast food. You'll learn really quick. It's better to learn about this psychological shit before someone is smart enough to use it on you. Because, like, if you down this shit too much, that's cool. But that means that someone knows exactly how your mentality is and how to get you to act a certain way. You gotta be careful with that shit. And it's crazy because this is like, I like, you don't like, <clears throat> it's like, I like, sometimes I try to explain to people, like there's functional and non-functional, non-functional and functional are on the extremes. Like if you can still go to work and pay your bills and not be bothered and drink like an absolute fucking fish, a three fucking pints of liquor every day for 20 fucking years, you're still a functioning alcoholic. 
However, if you can't make it work, if you don't brush your teeth, if you don't shower, you've been like just in and out of shit, every cent you spend is always on alcohol or something like that. You've alienated friends, family, you can't keep a job, you live, you don't even live in a car, you live in the, bo the dog house with the goddamn dog and the dog's sick of your shit. You ain't doing nothing to lease, make justification for why you're fucking drinking. Like, it's not like you have a job, you're not mad about that, you don't have friends or family, sure you'd be sad about that. But there are people out in the world that don't have that shit. Dude, you're still fucking it up. That would be a non-functioning alcoholic. That, like, that's the difference. And it could work the same with, like, drug addicts and all that shit. There, like, there's always people who are able to work it and people who are not. And the problem is, is that people will always take the middle ground of psychological shit. And there is no middle ground. Either you're capable... Or you absolutely are not. And the absolutely is literally, like, you can't. Like, it, it's too much of an inner... It, like, psychological shit can become too much of an interference with your everyday shit. And that's the thing that people don't understand. It, like, it literally hinders you completely. Like, you... like And, and the thing is, some people who get that far into it... They might know that, thank you for, they might know that they need help, but they are probably more than likely not capable of helping themselves. And that's the thing that people don't seem to realize. It's like, once they get to that, <laughs> once, you, once you start rolling down the hill, you're, you're probably going off the cliff. It's one thing to stand on the edge, but once you actually go over that shit, mm, no. No, that, that could be hard to get out of unless you have the right intervention. Um, and some, and like a lot of times, and I've seen this so many times, family will fuck up someone's like medical shit at all. Like, you know, the family, they could like give the doctors the entire history of your psychological shit, or they can fucking just stick in there because it's easier than like actually dealing with you, which is a lot of cases with uh, patients I had over a good old chart, man. There were a lot of patients who like their families would actually end up signing them in. Whether they were understanding of that or not. Because a lot of patients, they were in there just because, like, the workers needed that cut. Um, but a lot of times, there would be people who would actually put their family members in there. Not even tell them what the fuck was wrong with them. They had to figure it out on their own before they get the right uh, prognosis and diagnosis. Like, that shit almost happened with uh, my ex-husband, too. Uh, what was it? Like, he's bipolar type 2. And he ended up going into, like, a medical care place where, like, it was just like, I was the only one in the hospital waiting to get him transferred. And none of his family even bothered showing up, but they, but they were definitely there to make sure that, like, the doctor didn't know he, his family had that history in it. Like, I think his grandmother spent, like, what did he tell me? 20, 30 years before she finally got the right medications. And mind you, this is West Virginia, which is notorious for putting people in sharp for nagging or beating a horse or being a woman. And there have been plenty of lobotomies in that bitch for no reason. But, like, you know, that, that like, thank you, found. But, yeah. Let's get back on to this, because I don't even know how I got that far, but, like, yeah. But I think it was a psychology thing, but it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Let's get back into this. I was just rambling shit. My bad. Fact time. Because it isn't just a few planets that have gone rogue. According to researchers at both NASA and Osaka University, there are approximately six times as many rogue planets in our galaxy as there are regular ones and 20 times as many stars. If that ratio is correct, that means there are around 2 trillion rogue planets in our galaxy alone. The problem with numbers That's like that is they're literally impossible for our puny human brains to comprehend, so Maybe let me help you to visualize what 2 trillion planets really looks like. If all the rogue planets in the Milky Way were grains of sand, they would fill 4 entire shipping containers. If that doesn't blow your mind, I'm worried you don't have a mind to blow. Rogue planets aren't That's the exception. Rude. They're the rule. And with so many of them knocking around, I can't help but wonder, could they harbor life? Intuitively, it feels like the answer to that question should be a I would not be talking to A planet that. without a would host star would receive that. practically mm -hmm. zero external energy. It would be No, a there's no way. If something's looking at me like, no. 
No, 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 that just fucked me up. And, and, like, I don't give a fuck what it is. White people who find life on another place, it, it take three black people. Man, woman, sure. If it's two men, they're not going to listen to the black woman. So bring, like, two black chicks and a dude. Because, like, he'll listen to both of them. Hell, actually, I'll take it back. Take, like, one older black woman who ain't dealing with no one's shit. She's in her masculine energy. She don't give a goddamn. You get, like, a younger one who don't take man's shit because she's because she gives a fuck more about what the older one thinks. Like, she ain't no mammy, so she's trustworthy. And then take just a black man who's not trying to impress anybody. Maybe his idol's uh, Malcolm X, but, like, he's not an extremist. But he wears glasses like him, right? Just take them three motherfuckers with you. Because if you start trying to talk to somebody, you you need to look at them. You need to look at them. Because they're going to tell you if it's a good idea, just by the look on their face. Now, you might be wondering why they're staring with a serious look. That's not seriousness. That's straight fear. Because first off, we don't know what this thing is. We know we can't communicate with it. And we're on its territory. We're in its neighborhood. This is its ghetto. And it's looking at us like, what the fuck are you and why are you fucking here? Like, you know, you need to bring them with you. Don't open the door. Don't ask hello. Like, it knows we're here. You don't need to say hello. You don't... There's no reason to be friendly with everything that, like, has eyeballs. There's no... You don't even know if that thing has eyeballs. That's probably just, like, its fucking teeth lined up and shit like a fucking squid sucky thing. We're trying to make friends with everything. Quit trying to find out... It, like, quit trying to find if living things. What if it comes and follows you home? I don't want to deal with that shit and get eaten by its eyeball sucking beaks, suckers. Ugh. Frigid, empty wasteland about as welcoming to life as the reactor room in Chernobyl in April of 1986. Or would it? Well, not necessarily. Because it turns out that not only could rogue planets be habitable, they might just be seeding the entire universe with life as we speak. Well, maybe we should leave them the fuck alone then since they got a job. Rogue planets are created in one of two ways. The first kind form just like stars, from the collapse of colossal clouds of dust and gas, but they never gain enough mass to kick off nuclear fusion within their cores, and are instead doomed to wander the cosmos for eternity, knowing that they never truly lived up to their potential. The second group form like regular fuck? planets in boring old solar systems, but at some point, the gravity of a larger planet yeets them out into empty space with such force they escape the gravity of their parent star and just keep going. Young solar. S mind you, mind you, we like. Didn't I just read something where, like, the Orion Nebula is just shooting uh, like twin pairs or pairs of planets out the ass? Like, making babies like it's fucking popcorn, just <laughs> all over to some bitch. Like, we've been seeing doubles all over the place. I've even seen doubles in the sky, but I didn't know what the fuck they was. So, it's like, uh... How are we gonna worry about what this planet is doing when a whole nebula is, like, kicking its kids out? Like, that's a lot of fucking kids. It's like, straight up, like, not my kids. Ugh. That's above, so below, huh? systems are chaotic places, and scientists now think that this sort of unseemly planet-yeeting behavior is actually extremely common. Which means That's there's terrible. a good chance our own planet has a long-lost sibling or two somewhere out there in the end of the it's darkness probably Mars. Space. Mars ain't talking to us anyway. Mars is still So, mad. with all these newly suspected planets to explore, what are the chances of one of them containing alien life? If you want to bake a life cake, you need three ingredients, a variety of chemical elements, a solvent of some kind, in our case water, and an energy source. <laughs> the first part should be pretty easy, the so-called chemical what building blocks of life, Why elements is like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen... Why does the cake nitrogen. have fucking eyeballs? Nah! Ah! <laughs> Why is his eyes out in its socket? In between the strawberries! Now the oven looks like it has a face to me. 
He's not even trying to look. It's like, uh, this is not my business. Well, look at him. Oh, that's so disturbing. Why would you do that? There, like, you could have kept it. Did it pop out? Because I didn't. I just happened to catch it. Look at this space Sometimes, lemon. In our case, water and an energy source. <laughs> the first part should be. See, I pay, I'm paying attention while I'm drawing. It's not like I'm fucking off. Um, there are a few things that disturb my ass. And, and this just... Okay. Alright, I'm ready. I'm ready pretty easy. The so-called chemical building blocks of life, elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, oh, are abundant all over the bad. universe, so we'd expect That's to find potassium. them on plenty of rogue planets. The second two parts, not so much. No, potassium is Here K. on Earth, we get both of them from the sun. It's K. It provides living things with energy, and it keeps the planet warm enough to support liquid water. What is Without energy? a parent star, a rogue planet is going to... What is energy? What is energy? We've got water and energy. Why is it made of lightning, though? Why Why is it made of little bits of lightning that almost look like stars? That's terrifying. Is there lightning on the sun? That's a really good question. I never thought of that. Would there need to be lightning, or would it just be straight plasma? Does the sun have heat storms? That's what I want to know. Is the sun capable of having a heat storm that makes it hotter than the rest of the time? That'd be interesting as fuck. Like, if Jupiter could have a whole hurricane on its surface that we could see with the naked eye, this this motherfucker should be capable of having, like, some menopausal heat strokes and shit. ...needs some other source of energy Probably to again. fulfill those roles. The question is, what? The sun is the major energy provider here on Earth by a huge margin, but it isn't the only energy provider. A whopping 0.027% of Earth's energy budget comes from within the planet itself. Partly from the decay of radioactive materials and partly in the form of heat left over from Earth's formation. For like, like, what kind of radioactive materials? Because, like, I, like, I, I, like, there's a lot. There's a lot. Like, has anyone ever, like, I should do that. I should just look up a bunch of random, like, nuclear waste shit. Um, cause that'd be interesting. Y'all know how much nuclear waste they actually bury into the planet? And I do mean bury. They bury them barrels. They bury that shit. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They bury. I think it's metal barrels. No, that doesn't make any sense. It would have to be some type of plastic. It would have to be some type of plastic. I'm just letting you know. I also think it's like, what? three to five days you can recover from radiation exposure. Like, normally, like, at a dentist or something, right? Uh, unless you run into one of them barrels. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, uh, mm. Four and a half billion years ago. On its own, this geothermal energy wouldn't be anywhere near enough to keep a starless planet warm. But if that planet had a dense atmosphere of some kind of greenhouse gas, it could theoretically trap enough heat to warm things up quite nicely. Trapping According to a study so published in 1999, a hydrogen atmosphere around 100 times denser than our own would be so effective at trapping geothermal heat, it would generate surface temperatures toasty enough to support liquid water oceans. That's a promising start, and geothermal energy isn't the only thing that can keep a rogue planet warm. Is it? It's easy to assume that rogue planets are lone wanderers. In fact, that's kind of implied. But just like regular planets, there's no reason they couldn't have moons. As you probably know, the gravitational tug of our own moon really? is largely responsible for oceanic tides. But it isn't just water that feels the pull of the moon. It's everything. A large moon will literally stretch and compress its parent planet in what I like to think of as a big incestuous gravitational massage. All that intimate gravity-based touching causes friction, and friction generates heat. We see this in action right here in our very own solar system. 
Moons like Europa and Enceladus experience extreme tidal forces from gravitational interactions between their massive parent planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and their respective moons. As a result, and despite being well outside of what's traditionally considered the habitable zone of our solar system, both generate enough internal heat to support subsurface oceans beneath thick layers of surface ice. But you want to go there! Like, like, how thick is the ice? Is it like lake ice where there's like you're gonna fall in kind of ice? What if like what if there's something like a Nessie underneath the water? I watched the movie. I can't remember what the fuck it was, but these dudes went into space, and at the end there was this chick left, and she decided to record the monster that was coming into this thing, and it was coming after her, and it was all sorts of liquid, and it looked cold as fuck. And it got her. Like, it got everyone one by one. I wish I could remember that movie, because I would love to watch it, because it got the first person while I was out, like, searching for shit, and then I guess another person went out, and then finally just broke into the thing and went after the third person. I don't know how it knew they were in there, but it, I guess it doesn't matter if it knows that, like, they're sh that they're coming out of that thing. Like, if they're, if, it, if they're coming out, there might be more in there. That, that would be my thinking if I was an animal like that. Like, you know that it came from there. You just don't know if they're all dead or not. Whereas, it might have just been attacking him because they didn't know if it was a threat because it could have been sentient too. But you really don't know in that movie. I really don't remember. So I'm just sitting here like, do you really want to go there after we imagine that shit in this fucking universe? Like, no. There is no, there's like, you know, if you want to believe that, that like, it's water underneath layers of ice, that's fine. But you want to go there. You want to go there? Is it like you want to go there? You want to okay? So between geothermal heat and friction from tidal forces, we can confidently say that we should find liquid water on some rogue planets or even their moons. But what about the energy needed to power living things? Until relatively recently, scientists were under the impression that every single living organism on Earth relied on the sun's energy for nourishment. In other words, they thought that the bottom of every single food water, chain huh? was populated by some kind of photosynthesizer, converting energy from the sun into food. Why the fuck is the wolf at the top? What the fuck is this? Is that a wolf or a dog or is it a bobcat? Why is that at the top? It, 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 it's the one that takes the most, like, primary reducers. Yeah, sure, maybe I'm reading this backwards, but why is he at the top? Why isn't the cow at the top? The cow at least eats the grass. That are the primary fucking producer. Why wouldn't the cow be up there? I, I don't like. I know I'm looking at this wrong. I'm probably looking at this wrong. Is it like the food pyramid? I thought it was the bunked or some shit. I don't. I, I, fuck y'all. Just fuck y'all. Fuck y'all with your need for pyramids to make sense of shit. It don't make no. Fucking if that were sense. true, it would be a bit of a problem for a rogue planet billions of miles from the nearest star. But luckily, it isn't. In 1977, scientists researching deep-sea hydrothermal vents discovered something remarkable. Bacteria were feeding on the rich chemical soup spewing out of the vents and turning it into food. It was the same basic concept as photosynthesis, only with chemicals as the input instead of sunlight. Today we know that isn't that the same shit that oh, that like was a primordial soup where whatever the fuck came out the water to live on the dry land is wasn't that the whole evolutionary theory behind that? Wouldn't that same shit still exist? Are we going to see new mutants come out the water? Is this a cycle here? That's my question. And, you know I'm just involved now. Mm -hmm. process as chemosynthesis and we can be confident it's a perfectly viable energy source to power life because it supports entire ecosystems of diverse creatures right here on earth Both now just imagine right you you're scared of the sun so you send down a ragbag team of rich idiots down to see if like the idea of these chemo synthesis chemosynthesis Narco synthesis. Anyway, um, imagine like someone wants to test this out, but you want to see how this works, so you send some test dummies down to check it. Right around where like the root of the world tree is. 
they don't make it because they're stupid, though. Like, you know, with the whole, like, controller. <laughs> Which, mind you, the controller wasn't an issue because that makes the most sense. Why wouldn't you use something that, like, works as a, like, hand-eye coordinating device? Like, doctors at one point were using Super Monkey Ball for hand-eye coordination to help with, like, their, like, um, recordings when it comes to the practical surgeries and shit. What was stupid was the fact that it was uh, Bluetooth. Like, why wouldn't you wire that some bitch? What What happens if if it doesn't turn off with the thing? You know, it was just one of the weird things. Um, but then again, it's like you know, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it's very strange, very interesting how there's something that doesn't need the sun and does the same thing the sun does. You know, as above, so below. So there's two ways out, apparently. But I guess it just depends which exit you're going to go. I don't know how I feel about the one with the water, though. I Like, there's something about the water, it's just... <clears throat> like, I know, I've heard from people who have actually drowned and survived their drownings that, like, there's a lot of panic and then all of a sudden just peace. Except for Tara, when Gemma got a hold of her. Poor fucking Tara. She, she was full of terror. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead around hydrothermal vents and cold seeps on the ocean floor and in certain cave systems. Okay, so some rogue planets should have the right chemistry for life. Right. Some should have liquid water in oceans, Which either on or beneath the surface. Okay. And some should have access to energy sources capable of sustaining life. Now, considering how many rogue planets there are out there, it seems extremely likely that some are going to be habitable. That's an intriguing prospect, and it might just explain one of the biggest mysteries in all of science. The origin of life on Earth. For dead matter to suddenly to turn into living matter, quite a lot of seemingly very unlikely things needed to happen. Amino acids had to band us together in extremely specific That's ways to form necklace. proteins. Oh, it looks like the enzymes. Long strings of various molecules had to somehow self-organize into forms that were capable of replicating themselves. And the first cell membranes had to spontaneously cobble themselves together to keep all those various bits and pieces in one place. None of these things are impossible. Self-organization in disordered systems seems to be a feature of our universe. But each of those steps occurring in just the right way to give birth to life seems so vanishingly unlikely that it's really hard to believe it ever happened. The missing ingredient here is probably time. Given enough of it, even the most unlikely things can happen. It's Why? your classic monkey typing Shakespeare sort of deal. Give him a weekend and you'll end up with several pages of utter nonsense. But give him a few billion years, and before you know it, he's wondering what light through yonder window breaks. But there's a small problem with that theory. Our planet is 4.5 billion English? years old, and according to our current best estimates, life first appeared here at least 3.7 billion years ago, and maybe as many as 4.2 billion years ago. Either way, things are going surprisingly quickly. And once they got going, early organisms got complex very fast. To some scientists, that just doesn't add up. A few hundred million years simply isn't enough time for a molecular monkey to bash out a living organism. And yet we know for certain that life was here, so what gives? Well, Maybe there we're a lot older than what we realize? Maybe we're aging too quickly for our own scales of measurement. Maybe we just can't tell the fucking time. Maybe, maybe, maybe we just don't know what act, what the actual time is. The time is forty four ninety three ten. <laughs> there are a few possible answers to that question. Perhaps the steps required to create life from non living matter are a lot more likely than we think they are. Some scientists even believe they're inevitable. Maybe we just got insanely lucky and landed ourselves a genius monkey that smashed out the complete works of Shakespeare on his very first try. Or, perhaps, life on Earth has been evolving for much longer than we think it has. And it's here that rogue planets might come into play.
According to the theory of panspermia, life didn't necessarily originate on planet Earth at all. It yes, travelled here from elsewhere in the cosmos. Yes! If that were true, Earth life might be billions of years older than previously thought. Yes! That would go a long way to explaining how life got going so soon after the formation of the planet. And See, and I think we came from the Orion Nebula or somewhere, or at least maybe even the Dark Horse Nebula. Wherever that fucking explosive looking thing is, I think we came from there. I think that's actually what we are. And it's kind of interesting that this has popped up um, in accordance to the shit I've talked to you. I'm so glad I, like, I found this today. What? I don't know anyone from Romney. Now I'm gonna get copyright claims. I don't wanna get copyright claims because, like, my mashup song is my ringtone. YouTube's petitioning people to use your... Anyway, but yeah, I'm pretty sure... I'm kind of... Thank you. Oh, now you're actually doing it the right way. But yeah, but that's what I think. That's what I really believe. I think we came from Orion. It makes the most sense. It does. Because it's just like, how are we here? Why are we here? Did we mutate shit? Was this even supposed to be a thing? Are we an infectious species? Not just humans, but plants and shit. All of it. Will we ever know? I mean, even if we did, someone's gonna go online and just uh, fuck it up. That's what people do. Like, they learn one thing online, and then they go and fuck it up and try to make it sound like something else. And it's just like, oh, good for you. Good for you. Um, uh, but I don't know. I guess people who are looking for a claim right now are just going to get what they deserve. I, I like, I, I just don't have the empathy anymore. It's just like, oh, okay, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. And how early Earth life achieved such surprising complexity in the first few hundred million years after it appeared. One of the biggest problems with the panspermia theory has traditionally been the question of how exactly the seeds of life crossed the vast distances between the stars. Space dust, or asteroids, are two of the most commonly suggested dispersal mechanisms, but any life hitching a lift on either of those will be exposed to the incredible hostile environment that is naked space. But what if life's been travelling around the universe in much cosier circumstances all along? We're just a from Could a, a passing ball. rogue planet have seeded Earth? We are literally the result of space sperm. How do you feel about that? How do you feel knowing that you're nothing but space sperm? You didn't even come from the fucking explosion. You're just the jizz left over. What's found in the fucking soccer towel. How does it feel? How does it feel? Go rub your face in the ground. <laughs> oh, look at it. Just look at it. It's everywhere. <laughs> From the window to the wall. Do I sprinkle you with my balls? All the spacey talls. All skis, skis, skis. This is just the stupidest fucking shit. I'm sorry, but it's just like, it, like it, but it's interesting. We're not, we might be space sperm. Not even space explosion stuff. That's what, like, probably... Well, I don't know. It's just all theories. But either way, I'm pretty sure we came from Orion. Because it makes sense, considering, like, Orion sounds like Iron O. Which is bullshit of me, because I was making fun of people who goes, like, human and who man and other shit like that. But it actually makes sense with the Orion stuff, because it's just like, well, yeah. Like, it, it, like you know how many people worship them? Three fucking stars? Just them three in particular. Probably weren't even paying attention to the rest of them, but it was them three. And it's like they knew that's where home was. Or at least what we... It could be... I don't even know what the fuck it is. Or, even if, it's even, or if it's even worth it, like trying to travel back to... But there ain't no Sukihanas or Sexy Reds there. I ain't gotta listen, uh, worry about, like, no men with podcasts. I ain't gotta deal with people, like, just being a certain way. I can just go. And it looks like a fun place to go. Plus, I've never been to...
to that part, probably. And if I have, I ain't got, been there for a minute, so I might as well just go and visit. Mm. This is how I'm saying that. Earth with life four billion years ago? Might we all be aliens on an alien world without even knowing it? Okay, so we're well into the realm of wild speculation here, no. but it's a hell of an idea, Rollis. Nigga, where are you born is usually where you're from. But you can move and be from somewhere. Like, after three to five years, I'd consider you from an area. Like, just straight up. If you're born there, automatically. That's just your hometown. But if you live there longer than three years, I assume that you're just from there. That's where you're from. We've been living here how long? Four years? Universe time? 4.5 billion years. We'll say universe time, so like four years. Not like no six months or nothing. We've been here for a minute. Fucked up shit. You can tell someone's lived here. You're graffiti on everything and shit. Every, there's arguments all the fucking time to the point where there were even weapons involved. Someone's always talking about money and how someone's trying to rip them off or some shit. You tell someone lives here. You can tell someone lives here. Hey. When we look for life out there in the universe, we tend to search for conditions that are as close to our own as possible. Mm -hmm. An orphaned planet cruising through the darkness of space billions of miles from the nearest star is about as different to planet Earth as it's possible to be. Yeah, I was about and to say, yet, that's by some that's estimates, a... rogue planets are home to more habitable real estate than can be found anywhere else in our galaxy. And that makes them incredibly important. As of today, they're still poorly understood. For obvious reasons, they're difficult to detect, and that makes them hard to study. It seems extremely likely that some rogue planets will prove to be habitable. But for now, it's impossible to say for sure you know, just I how many. The good one. news is, if just one in a hundred thousand turn out to have the right conditions for life, that's still 20 million habitable rogue planets zipping around our galaxy. And who knows? These lonely wanderers might just be our universe's silent farmers, sowing the seeds of life wherever they go. Yeah, but you want to go there and, and like lit a jizz on you? No, no, no. We're we're not about that life. We are not about that life. Let me find some uh, just one more to watch on here. That way we end this with something subtle. Uh, two seconds. I'll t like I can give us a nightcap. Hmm. Should I give us a nightcap? This is already an hour and eleven minutes. Mm. I'll find this one more. Hopefully, short to watch. I always want to watch like a cop video because I did see one where this crazy lady was just screaming, "Are you white?" over and over again, and I wasn't sure what the fuck I was listening to. But I felt bad for her because no one was answering her. It was just like, oh, that white privilege isn't fun when it, 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 when they use it on you, huh? That's sad, man. That's sad. You need like two seconds here. Okay, so I'm just gonna close this out because it's simpler. And plus, I want to like finish this up. I'll probably do another one, but I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good night. Bye.